up for a moment to chapter 20, the spoilers. Um, prior to this chapter, Taryn had been with Ann Law, and all I've put up here is kind of a, a list of the people that Taryn meets more or less in order. I mean, this is, I think, almost in exact order. He starts with the Enchantresses. They tell him to seek out the mirror. He then runs into Eden, Gorian, and Gosh, Smoit, all the way down to these. And I have not put down, you know, he runs into Dorth um, again at the very end. But in this chapter, the spoilers, he leaves Anlaw um, because although he wants to be a potter, that's, that is what he figures out. He really has his heart set at. He learns, realizes he'll never have the skill. Okay, and so he leaves again, and he goes off to Comet Marin, and he finds out that that comet or comet has been raided relatively uh, frequently by a band of roving, you know, robbers. He figures out who they are. They're Doroth and company, and so he suggests a plan. Not of attack, but of ambush, because he knows they're going to come back, and he suggests how they can defeat them. And they do defeat them. One of the leaders of the comet, Dridwas, has a son, about the same age as Terran, who gets injured in the battle. Um, and Terran then leaves. But before he does, page 207, Lassar, Dridwiss' son, says, um, to you I owe much more than sheep. Okay? And what, what Lassar is saying there is you've taught me something. That is, you've taught me that we can stand up. We can oppose these roving brands, uh, bands of robbers and such, and we can do something for ourselves. We don't have to suffer at their hands, etc. Okay? He goes back <clears throat> to Anlaw, and on page 208, Taryn says, Dridwas told me I was no stranger but a friend. For that I'm glad. I only wish that I weren't a stranger to myself. And he asked that question that we talked about the other day. What use am I to myself, to anyone? None that I can see. Well, we could go back through these and notice he saves them. Okay, He helps Anlaw out for a while. Doesn't become a potter. He learns from Anlaw. He learns from Gwivik. He learns from Heaven. He helps Lanio. He finds the two stones that become the grindstones for them. Right? He helps Craddock. Yeah, Craddock dies, but that's not Terran's fault. But he helps him prior to that. He doesn't help Dorath. Dorath helps himself to melon loss, Terran's horse and his sword. Okay? He destroys Morda, so he helps Predane that way. He helps Smoit figure out how to solve the problem of Gorion and Goss. That is, they will never fight over those stupid cows again because of what Terran suggests to Smoit. And he helps Eden. He gets Eden's farm essentially back up and running by figuring out how to solve this problem. So he's forgotten all that, essentially. Why? Where's all of his focus when he says, what use am I? It's on himself. He's not thinking of anybody else. He's only thinking of himself. Why? Because he began this story, and we could go all the way back to the first story, thinking only of himself. He wasn't thinking of Call at the beginning of the first novel, or Dalbin, or what needed to be done at the farm. He was thinking, I want to be a hero. This one, he was thinking, I want to know who I am. Why? So I can marry Ailanri. Not who is right to marry Ailanri. That is, who's the, the proper person, so to speak. Okay? So, Anlaw replies, the folk of Esau would gainsay you, and there might be others who would be welcome, who would welcome a stout blade and a bold heart. In other words, you know, Terry, you might not discover who you are, but you can always be what? 
essentially a mercenary, hired gun. There will be other Kamats that need, he is suggesting, defending. A hired sword. He's saying, is that, is that all I'm supposed to be? When I was a child, I dreamed of adventure, glory, of honor, and feats of arms. In other words, kind of of that. A hired sword, when I was a child, that would have been a good thing. Now, I think these things are shadows. Okay, if they are shadows, then what does that imply? What must every shadow have? Or, put it another way, what makes a shadow? You have to have light in order to have a shadow. What else must you have? Something that casts the shadow. That is, there has to be something real, something substantial. The light shines on that produces the shadow. So, if adventure, glory, honor, and feats of arms are shadows, they're shadows of what? There has to be some deeper, more meaningful reality behind those things. So, Ann Law says, if you see them as shadows, then you see them for what they are. In other words, very good, Taryn. You're growing. You no longer see them as things in and of themselves. Glory is not something in and of itself. It what? It comes from someplace else. Honor is not something in and of itself. It comes from something else. Okay? Many have pursued honor, and in the pursuit, lost more of it than ever they could gain. Does that describe anybody that we've met before in the novels? Think Black Cauldron. Eladir. What honor did Eladir have? Did he begin with in the novel? Solely. His name, right? Prince of Penlarku. That was it. What, what stood behind that? Nothing. He was poor. He was the youngest son of several sons of a poor northern kingdom. His name really was the only thing that granted any honor to him. Okay? He was seeking other honor, other fame, other glory, right? And he was going about it all wrong. And yet he finally gets it. How? By not thinking of himself. He doesn't jump into the cauldron thinking, Oh, I will win great honor this way. He jumps into the cauldron for what? For his friends. To save everybody else. Many have pursued honor, and in the pursuit lost more of it, like Eladir, than ever they could gain. But I didn't mean a hired sword. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. He stopped and says, To see them for what they are, that is, to see adventure, glory, honor, to see them for what they are, hmm, maybe, maybe, perhaps, perhaps, are his words. And then he tells Taryn a story. The common lore tells how one may see himself for what he is. Whether it be true or no more than an old wife's tale, I, but the lore says that he would know himself need only gaze in the mirror of Lunet. And remember the other day, that's not on the board there, that's the board there. I put up on the board, you know, what was outside the Oracle of Delphi. Know thyself. And then Socrates kind of expanded on that and said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So if you want your life to mean something, you got to think about what your life means, which is what Taryn's doing, right? So he brings up the mirror of Lunet. And Taryn's like, oh my God, <laughs> I'd completely forgotten about that. That's what I set off on this for. That is, once he met the three enchantresses, The goal of my quest from the beginning, I'd given up searching. 
Now do I find it when I seek it least of all? Notice, when he has stopped searching, it's kind of dropped in his lap. When he stops focusing on himself, what? The answer to who he is is essentially given to him. Anla, your quest? Question mark. What quest? Karen, I, I would have no pride in the tongue. That is, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about it. I'm a, kind of a damn fool. He goes, no. Taryn, once I would have asked nothing better than to find the mirror. Now, even if it were in my hand, I would dread to look in it. Why? Maybe he doesn't want to know himself. Think about this. Or, the unexamined life is not worth living. Think of what it means to examine yourself. Not examine like test, though it might have that meaning, but examine like a doctor's examination. Probing. Getting deep inside. Looking at oneself honestly, objectively. Not, oh, I'm a good person, I'm da da da. da. I understand your fears, Ann Law says. The mirror may put your heart at ease or it might trouble you all the more. Such is the risk. Choice is yours. But know this. It's not that kind of mirror. That is, it's not a mirror that you find encased in silver. And you can hold it up and stick it in a pocket, etc. He says, no, it's close by. Two days. It's in a cave. In other words, it's a pool of water. What enchantment gives it power? For enchanted it must be. Why does Terran think it must be enchanted? What does he think it means for the mirror to be a pool of water? What do you look at when you see in a pool of water? What Greek myth do we get from a guy who looked into a pool of water? Narcissus. And what happened when Narcissus looked into that pool of water? What did he see? Himself. And what happened? He fell in love with him. That's why we have a narcissist complex. Okay? Someone who is an egomaniac falls in love with himself. And what happens? Eventually. He drowns. Okay? So, Taryn thinks the water must be somehow magically enchanted. So that when he looks in it, he's not going to see himself. But he's going to see, like, you know, the opening beginning of Star Wars. You know, credits or Words are going to go across the water, and they're going to tell him everything about it. Taryn, you are a... Ann Law says, yeah, it is enchanted to those who deem it so. That is, if you think it is enchanted, then it will be enchanted. Have you looked at it? Nope. I know who I am. Ann Law Clay Shaper. For better or worse, that knowledge will serve me my lifetime. Taryn, and what knowledge will serve mine? Because remember, Taryn's still pretty young. 15, 16, maybe 17. Okay? So, next morning, he goes off. He makes his way. He finds the mirror. He sees the shallow basin, page 212. <clears throat> and... He looks over, bottom of, two, of that page 212. Cave was utterly silent. It seemed that even the falling of a wisp of dry moss would shatter the reflection. His hands trembled as he saw his own face, travel-worn, sun-scorched. With all his heart, he longed to turn away, but forced himself to look more deeply. Were his eyes playing tricks on him? Closer, he knelt. What he saw made him cry out in disbelief. Gurgi shrieks, there's Doroth. Okay. He and Doroth fight. I'm going to skip a bunch. Doroth stomps in the puddle. Doroth, notice, looks in it, and what's he see? Middle of 214. It holds nothing. Why? Because Doroth doesn't know what the puddle 
represents. He doesn't know what the funnel stands for. In other words, Doroth doesn't see anything because he doesn't expect to see anything. He doesn't want to see anything. Terran, who wants to see something, sees something. Okay? Terran's blade shatters Doroth's blade, 215, and Doroth flees. Okay? Go on to 216. Terran goes back, goes back to Anlaw. And Anlaw says, so have you looked in the mirror? Terran says, yes, but nobody will look in it ever again. It's been destroyed. He tells him what Doroth did. So you didn't see anything then. I learned what I sought to learn. Anlaw, I will not question you, Wanderer, but I will listen. What's he, I mean, he's clearly saying what? you saw, but I'm not going to pry it out of you. I saw myself. In the time I watched, I saw strength and frailty, pride and vanity, courage and fear, of wisdom a little, of folly much, of intentions many good ones, but many more left undone. In this, alas, I saw myself a man like any other. The in this, what is the this? It's everything that came before that. I looked and I saw a little bit of strength, yeah, and some weakness, the frailty. I saw a lot of pride and vanity puffed up with myself. I saw some courage and I saw fear. A little bit of wisdom, but notice a lot of folly, a little bit of wisdom, but a lot of foolishness or idiocy. Of intentions, oh, great intentions, a lot of good intentions, but many left undone. I'm just like any other man. But this too I saw. So, he's recognized he's human. Why is this kind of eye-opening to him. Yeah, he was hoping for more. He, he wants to be better than average. What's he seeing? The thing that binds everyone, the things that bind everyone together. Okay? But I saw this too. Alike as men may seem, each is different as flakes of snow, no two the same. You told me you had no need to seek the mirror, knowing you were an clay clayshaper. Now I know who I am, myself and none other. I am Terran. Meaning, there is no other clay clayshaper and there is no other Terran. But notice he doesn't say, I am Terran Wanderer, or Terran of Cairdalbin. Just Terran. Anlaw says, after a few moments, if you have learned this, you have learned the deeper secret the mirror could tell you. Perhaps it truly was enchanted. Terran, there wasn't any enchantment. It's just a pool of water. Most beautiful I've ever seen, but just a pool of water. At first, he says, I thought Ordu had sent a fool on a fool's errand. She didn't. She meant me to see what the mirror showed me. Any stream, any river, would have given me the same reflection. But I would not have understood it then as I understand it now. In other words, if I had left right here and gone to the marshes and find a, found a clear spot of marsh and looked in, he says, here, wouldn't have understood it. Why? Because he had to go through all this. He had to experience all of this. As for my parentage, it doesn't matter. True kinship has not to do with blood ties. Kinship, that is belonging to a family, doesn't matter. Blood isn't important. 
however strong they be. I think we are all kin, brothers and sisters, one to the other, all children of all parents. The birthright I once sought, I don't seek it anymore. That is, what's the birthright he once sought? Noble birth. I don't anymore. The folk of the free comets taught me well. Manhood is not given but earned. Even King Smoyton Cantriff Catafor told me that, but I did not heed him. So, he starts off here. He mentions Ordu, skips Eden for a moment, and he goes to Smoit, and then he goes to Lanio. Why? Because these two aren't really that important. Craddock, we'll leave aside, Lanio said life was a net for luck. To Heaven, life was a forge. To Dwivek, life was a loom. They spoke truly, for it's, it's all of these. But you, you've shown me life is one thing more. It's clay to be shaped. As a raw, as raw clay on a potter's wheel. What's he mean? It's what you make of it. And that's why Ann Law says, so how will you shape your clay? How will you shape your life? I can't stay in Marin, much as I love it. Dalbin waits for me. The place, not the person. As it always has waited, my life is there, and gladly I return to it, for I've been too long away. Notice, he left Kerr Dalbin what to find himself. And he found himself, and where does himself belong? Back in Kerr Dalbin. So he never really needed to leave. But he did, in order to find himself. Don't forget us, we won't forget you. Taryn, I have the sword I fashioned, I have the cloak I wove, and I have the bowl I shaped. In the friendship of those in the fairest land of Perdane, no man can find greater treasures. So, he goes off to find himself. What does he find? What does he find about himself? Where is his identity? Is it out there? No. What did he see when he looked? He saw inside himself. So what's he learned? Who is Taryn? Assistant pig keeper? Notice he doesn't call himself Taryn Wanderer. He doesn't call himself Taryn of Caradolvin. He doesn't call himself Terran Assistant Pig Keeper. Why? Each of those is like an occupation. It's a job. But Heaven calls himself Heaven the Smith, Dwivik, Dwivik the Weaver, Anlaw, Anlaw Clay Shaper. Why? Because their occupations are kind of the fulfillment of their being. That is, Anlaw finds his fulfillment in making. Dwivok finds her fulfillment in making. Heaven does also. Is Taryn going to ultimately find his fulfillment in making? No. He's not a maker. What did he want from the very beginning? He wanted a sword. We're going to find Taryn's fulfillment does have something to do with a sword in the next book. We're going to stop there because my throat's gone. <clears> throat> um, we'll have a quiz over uh, Taryn Wanderer on Wednesday and uh, try to just read as far as you can into The High King. I'm going to try and get through it a little more quickly, but I know we won't.